Welcome to the second of three Summer Caring Conversations. Uh, my name is Karen Major and I am a member of the Women to Women Steering Committee. Uh, this is our second uh, uh, Summer Caring Conversation that we're doing instead of our summer event. Last year we had, or every year we have a nice summer event, which we are not having this year. And last year we also had some really nice lunches with some community conversation and we're not doing that either. So instead we're going to have uh, three different conversations using this Zoom format. And uh, this is the second last week. We had a really good conversation about um, how education is going during this time of the pandemic and how um, we're able to work with families and kids who are at home. And I think all that stuff is posted on the Women to Women or the uh, Illinois Prairie Community Foundation website. So we're wanting to record and have this available to anybody who wants to hear these. Um, our conversation today, uh, our 90 minutes, is about race, race relations, race injustice. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can cut it these days. And I have the honor of introduction and facilitating some conversation between our two speakers, uh, both of whom I have known for, anyway, I'm just gonna say a while. And uh, uh, the first, so I'm gonna introduce both of them. And uh, I think Linda's gonna go first. So our first speaker, is uh, Ms. Linda Foster, the president of the Bloomington Normal Branch of the NAACP. As a friend, activist, mother of Eric and Matthew, and the second woman in history of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Bloomington Normal Branch, to be led by a female, I take pride in serving my community with passion and sincere fervency. I am a proud retired administrator of Illinois State University and the first black woman to reach the level of director in my department. I am a product of Chicago Public Schools. I studied organizational leadership at Eureka College and received my Master of Social Work from Illinois State University. I'm a testament that inner city life does not limit educational accomplishment and leadership greatness. My involvement in organizations and boards include the underlying mission of how does this help the underserved, underrepresented, and the voiceless. Some of my involvements include, but are not limited to being a member of the Minority and Police Partnership, Certified Deputy Register, Connect Transit Advisory Committee, National Association of Social Workers, Domestic Violence Trainee, OMOJA, oops, sorry, um, Acknowledgement of Black graduates at ISU, Moms Against Gun Violence, Volunteer Food Pantry Helper, and Family Community Resource Center, Family Support Advocate, which includes educating the community concerning manners regarding the preservation of families. For relaxation, I ride a 750cc Honda Shadow and consider myself an amateur but engaged photographer. I'm a member of the Order of Eastern Stars and have sisters that keep me grounded. I attend Mount Pisgah Baptist Church and believe we must be our brothers and sisters keeper. So I'm thrilled to introduce Ms. Linda Foster as one of our speakers. <clears throat> our other speaker, Dr. Doris Houston, who I haven't known for quite as long as I've known Ms. Foster. Uh, Dr. Doris Houston is a professor of social work uh, and interim director, department head of the School of Social Work at Illinois State University. Beginning in July of 2020, she will transition into the newly created role of interim assistant to the president for diversity and inclusion at Illinois State University. Doris received her doctorate in human development and family studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her areas of expertise include equity and inclusion in education and human services, culturally centered child and family well-being and organizational change. Prior to joining the faculty at ISU, Dora served as an outcome evaluation specialist at UIUC's Institute of Government and Public Affairs, where she provided organizational development training services to youth prevention organizations funded by the Illinois Department of Human Services. 
She's a native of Chicago, Illinois, and now calls Bloomington Normal her home. Doris has an adult son who's married with a five-year-old son, and you've been spending the last week with your grandson. Isn't that right, Doris? I have. It is. Uh, it has been a wonderful time. He's kept me on my toes. I'm sure. I'm sure we could do another 90 minutes on how grandchildren could kill us before the end of our visits with them. Um, okay, so uh, I think that Linda is going to go first. If I, I ask that people keep your mics muted um, while the presenters are talking, uh, hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions and conversation. Um, I think there are some screen shares we'll try to work out. And uh, I think uh, Linda, Ms. Foster, it will go first. Thank you. And thank you to each one of you all. I am pleased to be here with Dr. Houston doing presentation. This has allowed us to come together even closer to just talk about the things that are going on today and what has gone on in the past. So for each of you to be on this call, we appreciate that. Um, the title was Conversation About Race. And it, that, that kind of took me about back because I, I was thinking, you know, what kind of conversation do you have about race to a group of women that are prominent and that are engaging in their community and that have done uh, numerous things uh, that have improved? Uh, oh, Lord. This, oh, okay. I thought it cut off. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I you thought it me cut off. Do you and, want me to pull this out? I put the screen uh, on no, you, You're fine because I'm going to go ahead and talk. Uh, and so thank you for uh, uh, being on this call. Because uh, there is a lot to talk about, but there's nothing new to talk about. The only thing new is the year. It's 2020. And so the stuff that we're going to talk about are things that have impelled us to move ahead and to continue this movement of getting our community into a place that is a oneness and not based on a colorness. Uh, our agenda includes the history of systemic uh, racism. We're going to start from, the, from almost the beginning. And then we're going to show our personal stories and then we're going to, uh, as always, you have to have, have, to have the data. Um, and then uh, what are those issues that we are facing within the Bloomington normal area? And then what can we do? You know, what if, what if women can we do? And, and I specifically say women uh, because about this presentation, we want to talk about the women, the impact of what women have had uh, over the longevity of where we're at today. So I'm going to go ahead and just start off and, and just talk about some of the things have uh, made history as far as uh, the color barrier. And that, uh, you know, that started uh, sometime uh, back in 1600. A little bit before that, uh, African Americans were pretty much living a free life. And then it came about that they were transported uh, to Virginia for the for the labor. You know, the thought was that, and I'm, I'm gonna keep it very simple. And the thought was that uh, you know, how do we get uh, commodities? without two costs. And so, hence, slavery. And in doing so, you know, African Americans were treated uh, less than less than human. Um, they were even looked at as only three-fifths of a person. And, and as we fast forward to to the impact of what slavery has had, we find ourselves dealing with issues 
of law determines freedom. And then you have to deal with the separation, but equal. So everything is geared toward what are those facets that impel Black America from being American. It's true American. Uh, if you look back, uh, there were situations in which uh, the cost of freedom cost. That in order to be free, you had to be willing to pay. And so that's the point. Freedom is not free because it costs to be free. And then you look at the separation, but but equal. You look at at the, at uh, what are some of the things that that were brought forth to try to address these disparities. Uh, and over the time, uh, things were uh, getting better. But acknowledgement of things were now being told. You look at uh, 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 the boycott. You look at the railroad, the Underground Railroad. You look at the uh, uh, the times in which uh, the board, the Brown versus the board, that everything had to be fought for. Hence, 2020. The things that were given to us after our uh, uh, initial marches and, and, and deliberations and, and all of the, uh, the things that would uh, bring us to the forefront, everything that has been achieved has been achieved through the act of marching. The things that away from us has been the act of riot. Now, we got a situation right close to us, right here in Springfield, that there was a race riot in 1908. And during that time, there was a situation where a white female alleged that Black men had raped her. Two black men had raped her. And from that undertaking of, of hearing that, whites went to show their displeasure by going into an area where blacks were prospering, doing well, uh, living the life as much as they could. And they had ownership, and and their families worked together. But after this uh, uh, situation and this allegation, this mob of white people uh, went to the neighborhoods where blacks uh, were being successful, and they burned it down. They burned it down, uh, looking for them two blacks. Down, they burned down businesses and they burned down homes. Now, I said that happened in 1908. Just a little less than a year later, now you have the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. It's come from the birth of what happened in Springfield, which is only 60 miles away from us. And in doing so, the McLean County Sheriff, understanding the severity of what was going on, took the two men and allowed them to be jailed here in McLean County. So there's a connection between Springfield and Bloomington about how we as people look at race. So we are so thankful that uh, McLean County played a role inside the
uh, the two gentlemen and, and come to find out that that what the uh, what the allegations were they were they were untrue. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have we have an unsettled group of people that don't know where to go, what's next. But you also have a group of people that are resilient. And if you fast forward today, we're still here. Uh, as we look at Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the race riot, and, and I know some people think that uh, and that in Tulsa, same thing, accusation put 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 black establishment, you know, the um, I uh I have been privileged to be around people and family members that are that were around during that time. And to hear the story about how how black, you know, without the power still felt as though they could survive. And uh, so with, with, with Rosa Parks coming, before that we had, we had the death of, of Emmett Till, we had the sit-in movement, we had the Birmingham church bombing, you know, you know, a full of girls died, you know, um, you had the, you had the, um, you had the Rodney King situation. Now we're moving up to where there's film. And they are, they are uh, uh, proof because the lynching wasn't enough. The lynching of, of people uh, standing around in, not in horror, but in, to see a, a black person hanging that in the days to come, that we would still have lynching issues and, and concerns. So slavery up until today, it's been an ongoing effort to, to be equal, you know, in, in, in the schools, in healthcare, in law enforcement, in employment, all of the gamut. It's an effort to be equal. Now, it is, it is I hope that today, that we just kind of enlighten you just a little about fight of African Americans when you talk about a race. And that, and that there's an understanding that there is a perpetual unstabling effect that it has. And I said we're resilient, but I didn't say it didn't affect us because it does. And it, it affects those that have a have a growing need to make things right. You know, we wanted to make sure that we kind of shared a little bit of that with you all as to why things are. They've always been marked. You know, there's always been some type of devastation of of property. Um, but there's always been someone to stand up and say, we can be better than this. And that we are, we are people that should embrace the difference. And so if we had this conversation, uh, we want each one to kind of dig deep inside to, to See what are those things that you may be carrying? What are those things that you can unpack 
And what are those things that you can pick up to make life better for someone else? I, uh, I showed the pictures because we had people standing around back to what was, what's been going on in 2020 and uh, in, in other situations where, where life has been, life has been lost, uh, but damages to, to property seems to be more important. And so um, it is ongoing effort that we would get to where we don't have to, uh, we don't have to use these type of methods to be heard. Not that I condone putting or, or, or anything of the like. Uh, hurtful people do hurtful things. So I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Dr. Houston go ahead and pick up the rest of this. Thank you, Linda. So again, in this short period of time, there's no way we can uh, cover all of the issues related to race, racism, et cetera. But as Linda and I were preparing, we thought uh, it would be helpful to see uh, some of the things that have gone on in our own backyards, whether that's Springfield, Bloomington, and then we learned from the, from talking that both of us were born and raised in Chicago. So uh, in terms of some more recent history, and when I say history, I'm saying, oh, the 60s, 70s, and we, we see still going on today, was uh, this whole issue of um, white flight, redlining, and community divestment. And when we look at some of our urban communities in particular, we see evidence of that and uh, we don't always understand what, uh, what the history was that uh, why certain areas, for example, you hear the south side of Chicago being this place that is considered uh, violent, uh, a place of urban blight. Um, but there have been just time and time again as black and brown families have sought a better life for themselves, for their children, and they seek to uh, live in great neighborhoods and send their children to great schools. There, uh, there are forces that are, have worked against our community. So I wanted to just share a little bit that uh, also has a personal note for me, but just to uh, make clear what we're talking about uh, when we think of white flight is essentially a large scale out migration of white families at the onset of increased racial diversity. So kind of a tipping point where if there are black and brown families that move into an area that was once segregated, uh, those demographic shifts then lead to people moving, being encouraged to move, the real estate, um, the uh, real estate firms that really encourage and, and um, and create fear that, oh, if people don't move, your, uh, your property values will go down and banks will uh, not be as uh, open to lending. So there, there are a number of systemic factors that really uh, lead to some of what we see in our communities today. So I wanted to share, um, just a couple of pictures. I uh, attended a Catholic school on the south side of Chicago. And you know, when you think of that, uh, obviously uh, that was certainly something that was um, a blessing, but you, you to be able to have that opportunity. But at the same time, you know, when you think of it, Black families and, and Latin, Latinx families want the same things for their children as others. Uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in, it was commonly known that uh, there was a high school right down the street from me. And it was commonly known that families that wanted a good education for their children would not send them to that particular school. 
because there really wasn't the investment, uh, the resources. It was a school that had been neglected. So many families you find in the city of Chicago would, would put their pennies together. And I mean, literally, uh, I was uh, sharing with Linda that our, uh, the diversity we had in terms of our meals uh, on a daily basis consisted of red beans one day, uh, lima beans the next day, black eyed peas the next day. And as a kid, I used to hate eating beans every day. But, you know, as I learned later, this was how my parents were saving money to be able to put into my education, et cetera. When you look at the, uh, 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 when you look at the photo on the left, the particular school I went to at one point was a boarding school and it was an all white boarding school. These are photos from a reunion. Um, when I started, and you see the photo on the left here, that was the group from 1972. There was just starting to be integration in that high school. Um, I started, I'll give my age away, I started there, uh, I started in 70, let's see, 75. So a few years after this picture. The first year I started, there were, you know, maybe about 30% African Americans and about 70% uh, white students. By the time I finished in 1979, uh, the school was pretty much completely all African American. And, and not that that is an issue at all, other than the fact that what I came to learn and understand later, and you can see in this picture on the right, that was the class of 77, by the class of 79, you can see uh, that there were no more white students um, there. But what I came to learn was with that change came a divestment in the community, it came a divestment in businesses, et cetera. And so the school today, it's no longer a Catholic school, it's actually a charter school. Um, this chart up here, it shows it's, uh, the area is 97% African American. But just wanted to show you what that in, uh, divestment looks like. As a charter school, I pulled some data on um, the school performance of Longwood, my old high school. The students are performing at 15% in the 15th percentile of uh, the state standards for, uh, for English and uh, language arts and 8% in math. So, so that means that 92% uh, of students across the state are performing better than students in that school. Um, interestingly, it's also a food desert. The closest grocery stores listed are George's Food and Liquor, uh, Stumpy's Grocery and Deli, and I've not been to those, uh, those stores. They are probably very good stores, but you don't see the, you know, the, the typical grocery stores that uh, you would see. So families, when you, and, and when you tie that into things like COVID and you hear, uh, the comments from health experts saying that blacks and browns have higher, uh, there's these health disparities and higher vulnerability. Well, if you're having to buy your food every day from a uh, food and liquor store that is, probably has limited fruits and vegetables, what are the impacts of those things? So I uh, just wanted to uh, bring that home to you. And sometimes when we're living through situations, we don't realize uh, that, that there are systemic forces and systemic factors that are going on. So I know that Linda wanted to share a, a little bit more about her personal story, because we also want just to have you know about us. We are professionals in our community, but that doesn't keep us from also having to experience the, effect, the effects of racism, uh, either personally or within our families. Thank you, Dr. Houston. Um, Linda's story, you know, who is Linda? And I know that my bio was read 
But some other things about when the other day, and I'm this black girl from the city of Chicago, living in a multi generational family setting, seeing her family speak up and step up against injustices and making positive changes along the way. This little black girl comes to bloom to normal, not knowing what God's plans were for her. I met some beautiful people, including my husband at the time. I made lots of friends, and I was able to make a living while working at Illinois State University. I made my way up the ladder that no other black person had achieved in my department. Overseeing the largest diverse full-time staff at Illinois State University. Then it happened. Accusations and allegations of child abuse. For many years with the support of my center of influence and allies along the way, I made it through. With unfounded, but founded, racism, discrimination, microaggression, bullying, and a lack of passion for humanity or culture. Fast forward to, to this little black girl that took up experiences and unwrapped them into helping the underserved and the hopeless. I received my MSW from Illinois State University in the spring of 2016. And I got that because of what I had endured and what the community had endured. My ex-husband, seeing that there was a need for a change and that he convinced me to go back to school to get my master's in social work. And he was going to go back to school. He had his BS. He had his nursing degree. And he was going to go back to be a lawyer. Because the, same, the things that we had seen, we knew that a change had to come. I retired from Illinois State in 2015. And I started volunteering with family community resources. Cases where families who get it were successful in working through the process that is unstable, unpredictable, unreliable, inconsistent, and not designed to appreciate differences. I'm president of the oldest, the boldest, the baddest, the largest civil rights organization there is. And I told you earlier that the beginning came from a race riot. But I didn't tell you what the mission was. And the mission of the uh, NAACP is to Abolish forced segregation, the enforcement of the 14th and 15th Amendment, equal education for black and white students, complete enfranchisement of all black men, men. In addition to that, we added economic and educational. agenda to our mission. Over time, we have seen that there is, there is no movement without a movement. And so the organization that I believe started 
not just about black, black and white, that felt as though that the injustices that were going on needed to stop. And just as today, the NAACP is comprised of black, white, Indian, Chinese, uh, and we're global. And so what we, what we achieve, we achieve for all. Even though the title of the National Association of Advancement of Color People, it is for all people. And so our work is not done. Uh, as we continue to do this 2020 uh, health disparities, and, and we're looking at the numbers of what's going on with COVID and the disparities and, and the number of deaths. Uh, but there's death all kind of ways. There's death in the light of whether it be health, whether it be in, in law enforcement, whether it be in economics, whether it be in housing, you can kill a person. Belief and passion in not honoring the work that they can do and willing to do to be equal. I'm here to continue to unmask injustices, fight against discrimination and racism, and show that we all can live together in peace and harmony. My life is open book. My voice is what I have. Talk and to say and to encourage and to build up. And as women, we need to do that. As women that have had, that are motherly, we should be the one, and we have been on the forefront, the suffrage movement. You know, even though it wasn't really geared toward helping the people, eventually that happened. But as women have fought on the battlefield in war, uh, you know, women women have, have fought um, in, 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 in bringing about a change. But as we do that, we need to always remember that could inevitably be something that can attack my family. You know, so what I need to make sure that I'm doing all I can, that if I help your family, I'm helping my family. You know, so my, uh, my hope is that even though I, I, I've seen some, I've, I've been involved in some things, I'm hopeful. Thank you, Linda. Okay, and I, I this brief story I shared about high school um, was also part of my story, but you know, just in terms of the pathway to um, to activism and act and uh, advocacy, I think of my mother. Her name was Anna. She had a um, a hair. She was a hairdresser, and in, on our in our home, we lived uh, in the Chatham neighborhood of Chicago. She had a um, a hair uh, hair salon in our home, fully equipped, etc. And but she was uh, she was a strong activist. Interestingly, one of the issues that um, families faced in my community, and this again goes back to that whole issue of access to food and, and uh, healthy lifestyles, uh, it was discovered that even in the grocery stores in our area, at the time Jewel Food, you guys, have, uh, we have Jewels here, uh, Jewel Food was one of the primary um, grocery stores. Well, in the black neighborhoods, we would get uh, practically spoiled 
really substandard fruits and vegetables and meats would be in our stores. We'd have to drive to another neighborhood, a white neighborhood, maybe an hour or 45 minutes away to, for the same prices or even cheaper to get high quality food. So my mother and, and several others, um, you know, you guys are probably familiar with uh, Rainbow Push and Operation Push uh, were pretty active, but there was an actual um, a boycott of the Jewel food because they were serving substandard food in our communities. So that's just one example of the things that we did. But, you know, in spite of these things, uh, Linda and I were sharing with each other, there was that sense of community. There was that sense of pride. There were block clubs in each area where our neighbors looked after each other, after our, our, the children, et cetera. So that's what we both bring I'd say to the table that we both bring that history and legacy of standing up. Um, and then uh, coming down to central Illinois, really having the opportunity to work with other people, uh, allies that uh, also care about our communities because we really have to move past this us and them. We are all in this together. Um, I had a, a quick video, Michelle, do you still have that? Um, and and this, it's just a couple of minutes and we wanted to share this because it really, it, can, it really tugs at your heart and it really shows just some of the uh, emotional impact that many of us, uh, whether we are professionals, whether we are stay-at-home parents, whether we are young people, and I know Linda is going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, march that went on in Bloomington Normal, but just think about what it is like to carry those additional burdens of, um, of, um, of facing racism. So, We'll go ahead and uh, start. It's just a couple minutes. All right, we're gonna try this. Okay. I don't know, if, do you have sound? Are you not hearing it? No. Nope. There should be a button at the bottom of Zoom that says, with a video, that says play to group or something like that. Okay. Sorry. If you don't see it, Michelle, maybe just start it over and we can just look, uh, watch it without sound. Yeah, I mean, I've been here. There's no actual wording. It's just instrumental playing in the background. So we'll start again. I'm still looking.
Okay, that uh, that ends the video clip. It some it's interesting how the music gives that little extra effect, but I think you can see this is the day in the life of a, a professional man, a judge, and regardless of education, regardless of professional status, if you will, uh, all of the things that he had to face, having uh, the elevator closed on him, people looking, uh, rolling up their car windows with suspicion, uh, being with his son at the pool and people recoiling. And so if you can imagine what that's like and how we carry around some of those biases that uh, really burden many of us who uh, are people of color that uh, have to go through life every day wondering um, if I set foot in a store, am I going to be ignored or am I going to be followed? Uh, if I'm in a professional role, will, I be ch will my authority be challenged? And uh, particularly as a female, um, will, will my knowledge be challenged? Uh, will my children be hurt? I don't know if you guys uh, heard, it was in the news, oh, maybe a week or so ago that there was a woman that had her son uh, and she had taken him to a restaurant and they were denied service because they said she had her little boy in, uh, in you know, a uh, shirt like a, uh, what do you call it? Just like a, a t-shirt and some shoes and they were denied service because they weren't following the dress code a nine-year-old boy. Meanwhile, you could see another child who was Caucasian that was in the restaurant, similar dressing. So just those everyday things, in addition to what we, you know, the racial violence and divestment, just those everyday uh, slights that we call microaggressions and how that can impact. And so as we continue this conversation, um, I just encourage us all, it, it really takes us all to examine some of those um, biases, implicit biases that we all carry that make us want to have suspicion against people who we consider others. And again, I, I think that the, the thing that I appreciated about that video, and we can send you the link, is the fact that this this person was a judge and regardless of that getting to that courtroom all of the the pain and suffering that he had to experience thank you thank you dr Houston. and we can have some q a after this about about the movie um you know as as we look at that movie and we, and we look at the, the challenges that he has had, um, probably unlike any of his colleagues had to deal with. Um, and so uh, that's why there's marches. Because yeah. it shows, and it, it shows the indifference. And it shows uh, where uh, people, people are, are, are losing patience. And, and, and people don't want change. Uh, the NAACP did a march at the end of uh, several months ago, and uh, at the end of May, May 31st. And we did that purposely because we wanted people to see and people to come together and people to have an outlet because what they were seeing around the country was devastating. And we felt as though that if we can come together as a community, that people will not internalize everything that they see, but realize that there are issues and there are concerns and that people are in pain. And, but that doesn't mean that our standing up together will uh, disinvite that there 
their ideas and, and what they see and what they believe. We want to take, we wasn't trying to take away anything like that. We were just trying to say, we've got to stand together. And we've got to be able to convert, as you guys say, have a conversation about race. So if we stood there with law enforcement, it wasn't the first time that we stood with law enforcement. It wasn't the second time we stood with law enforcement. Well, all of this in person, we knew that our leadership in law enforcement was about getting to be an improved community relations and they can improve, improve services to the community. So as we stood there trying to allow the, the police officers, uh, the chief of the police, which is the, which is the head, which is the leader, say, that we denounce what has happened to George Floyd meant a lot, meant a lot. And then if we move forward, there's been other marches and just one yesterday. Nobody listening. Then nobody was listening. And so uh, as uh, as they students talk while the adults listen and most definitely uh, school board, they heard some stuff that students have been experiencing ever heard before. And so the students, they were internalizing and trying to hold on. And to a day like yesterday, um, we want to continue to have a voice, but we want to continue to have a voice would encompass everybody. A little seven-year-old girl came up to me and she said, how can I make a difference? She said that, I don't, I'm not around this, but how can I make a difference? And that's where it starts, asking the question, you know, who do I want to be? Who do I want people to know me to be? And what can I do to make sure Simplify that portrayal of who I want to be. So that is just a small snippet of the things that are going on in our community, as I stated earlier, and as Dr. Houston stated earlier, we still have issues. But we also have opportunities to do better. Uh, I know there were some issues on, on ISU campus. Uh, students are frustrated and students feeling as though that they're not heard or they're not listened to. Um, and, 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 and in every avenue, in most cases, that's the background of it. And so we have got to stop and pause and listen to what people are saying, taking those clues and making sure that we are responding to them. We had um, some data slides, but since we're coming up on uh, one o'clock, I know that we wanted some time for uh, just some discussion and dialogue and questions. So Linda, do we want to open it up yet? Um, yeah, did they have any questions come in so far? Yeah, that's great. That's, this is the time to do that. Thanks yeah. guys. So if you have a question for either Linda or Doris, um, if you want to type it into the chat um, box, that would be great. Um, or you can unmute and ask or you can un 
You can unmute yourself and ask too. No question. I, I know me and Dr. Lisa are good. Come on, y'all. Okay. This is Rachel McFarland. Thank you um, for allowing me to join this today. And I've been reaching out to lots of my friends. What can I do to make things better? And I truly believe that racism is taught. And my biggest, you know, I want to help the world, right? General manager of the universe. How do we help people unlearn what they've been taught? And I know it's through conversations and I know it's through all this, but when people are born and then bred into this line of thinking, it is just a legacy that continues to go and grow. So help me with how to address that. Uh, I just watched the movie that uh... Dr. Houston shared with me. It's called The Black Pack. Have you guys ever heard of that? And, um, and it's my gentleman, Sean Rochester. And he said that, you know, you can talk to the ones that's open and ready. And then the other ones, you have to just keep it moving. Is that the gist of it you get, Dr. Houston? That yeah. the black we can plant that seed so that they can, maybe they don't get it today, maybe they don't get it tomorrow, but at some point, maybe they get it. But the ones that you see blooming, go for it. Encourage them. You know, band together and see what it is that you can do together to make a difference. Now, there is no one, two, three steps to, to doing this thing here, you know. You have got to grasp on what you're most comfortable with. And, and you have to be able to, to uh, think about what are those things that you're trying, trying to achieve and is, it, and is it pertinent and is it important and is it Yeah, um Thank you, Linda. And, I, and if I can add to that, um, I think of some a program that one of my colleagues has at ISU, and it's called Lunch and Unlearn. Um, you know, sadly, I have to say that we have all uh, we have not been uh, provided with the full, true history of our country, and certainly the media has not helped all the times. Uh, really only showing certain perspectives. So it really is up to us to, first of all, build relationships with uh, diverse people in our communities, meaningful relationships so that we, it, uh, we get to know each other, human to human, mother to mother, woman to woman. We have so many similar similarities. Certainly we have differences, but we all carry around those biases and uh, we have to acknowledge that and continue to work through those things. We, um, let me see if I can pull this up. Um, it was, uh, can you guys see this? So, and this is something actually from uh, my social work classes. The first thing that we always teach our students before we can really adequately, uh, effectively address racism and other types of biases, we have to examine those personal attitudes. Again, not that we created these on our own, but what we've learned in society and, um, and evaluate our own behavior and assumptions. I, I mean, I still do it every day myself. None of us are our experts and we have to give ourselves that space to be able to say, you know, I really didn't handle that well. Let me reach out to that person or that individual and, and, and apologize or ask for that feedback. 
uh, doing what we're doing right now, building community ties and relationships. The good news is we are living in a time now because of technology, we can have conversations and interactions with people, not only across the country, but across the world. And we can take advantage of our technology. Uh, again, knowing the community history. How many of you knew, A, uh, that Springfield had this very significant race riot and B, that the NAACP then formed out of that? How many people knew that? A few of you did. Uh, but really, just right in our own community, there's information that uh, we really have to seek out to learn our, our history. Uh, I sent, uh, and you guys will probably receive, there is a link from uh, Harvard that has a list of recommended readings for people who want to learn more. But uh, it is something that we can do to educate ourselves, knowing our community leaders and initiating this dialogue. So, you know, we are, thanks uh, to women to women, we're, we're on the right track doing some of these things. But also if this last one, promoting the economic and social empowerment of um, underserved communities. Many times we support and we want to through charity and giving, those things are absolutely important. But how are we also promoting the economic health and well-being of our communities? Um, if I can just show you, and I'm not going to go through all this various data, but just take a look at this one. Um, this is wealth differences by educational attainment. So as you can see um, here that even with a college degree, that there are huge disparities between uh, white families and black families. Um, and part of that is because the, we uh, black families and I'd say uh, Latino families, Native Americans, we have not had the uh, generational wealth, uh, access to homes and business and capital to pass down to our children. When you think about the Homestead Act, where many people, uh, European immigrants came to this country and were able to secure land and then from that uh, have some income and maybe sell the land and that helped pay for a home or whatever the case may be. When you're starting out, when you have a group of people who are starting out without those resources, the GI Bill, etc. It leads to these huge disparities. So really that's where we are, I would say, and Linda chime in uh, as a country, is that we really have to address those economic disparities that really then drive those other areas like uh, health care disparities, uh, child care, child welfare. Um, all of those things really tie into these disparities that we're seeing um, in, in um, median household wealth. And, and Dr. Lisa, you know, you, you make the point about redlining. You know, it, it's not that we can it. it was the system was designed not to allow us to be able to live where we could afford. And so best we could which was to just find a place to stay. You know, it may not have been the best, you know. And so uh, throughout that time, uh, you know, the government got involved in it more heavily and, and the movement brought attention to it. And so it erased the red line, but the, but the harm had been done. And it, 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 it's this ugly head. Every once in a while, it comes back up. You know, and so we we believe that you know economics is the driving force. You know, anyone that is in in any type of business or have, have a business background understand the importance of economics. So we had a question in the chat that um, says, since Women to Women is a group that funds grants 
are there needs where grants can really make a difference? Do either of you have a suggestion? You know, that is that is a, a good question because there are so many, uh, there are organizations that really push uh, education. And so those, those organizations that try to encourage young people to, to think about their future uh, need to understand the importance of how to get there. And, and education uh, is one way, trades are another way. Uh, but I think that, you know, as you look at those organizations that promote uh, new initiatives, I, I think that the money would be well well spent in, in those uh, avenues. Now, I, I will say that NWCB has a uh, has a uh, fad committee uh, called ACTO, Academic Cultural Technology Scientific of the Olympics. And that deals with everything with the exception of sports. So if you're into sports, you want well this is this is not for you. This is this is where most young people are not recognized. So they have a STEM program, they have uh, uh, music program, uh, they have cultural uh, programs, and so in doing so, it allows young people to explore those things that maybe they didn't have the support in, the, uh, in their uh, household or, or in the school. And so we have had competitions uh, this is our 10th year. And the competitions are held at uh, Illinois State University, who we partner with. And so we've been so grateful that we've got some of the professors involved, along with Illinois Wesleyan, to be uh, our judges. You know, uh, and so, uh, so I, I think that you got the Jewel Foundation, you got the Hundred Black Men. You know, you got you got the Link. You know, you got organizations. They're really geared toward uh, looking and and assisting young people reach goals. Did that help? Yeah. Um. So I, you know that that's one of the places that you can uh, follow through, and we can provide that information uh, if you like as well. Thank you. Is that all the questions? <laughs> that is. We, have, we have a question for everyone, don't we, Dr. Heath? You know what I mean? Uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that we allowed enough time for, for the Q&A and that, you know, looking at the names of, across the board that's on this Zoom, uh, we know that uh, you have a circle of influence in which you can affect a lot of lives, uh, whether it is uh, in your profession, it is in your neighborhood, or it is in your your uh, social uh, activity. And so, you know, we 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 wanted to to just kind of throw some things out at you uh, to to just consider the things that you can do. And, and we kind of touched a little bit about it earlier. You know, getting out your comfort. Um, I do it all the time, you know, but I'm comfortable doing it. I'm comfortable uh, talking with individuals uh, that are a, a different um, religion, you know, and that are a, a different uh, uh, belief about how to do things, you know, how to how to even uh, how to even look at uh, how they look at us, you know. What do you think about us? You know, and so uh, so I've learned a lot about how people have thought and felt about uh, us as Americans, us as black, you know, white, and, you know, talk to somebody different. And you'll find out that even though we think that we may know and understand, but talk 
talk to a real person about that, and they can they can tell you about their cultural uh, beliefs uh, about what they think about us. The other thing is that, um, and I, I tell you, every time we have these protests, marches, you know, we have a lot of people. It brings people together, all background. It brings them together, and it allows everybody to be on the same page. You know. We want our community to be a community that is sustaining, but is open to change and, and willing to do the things that would set us apart from anybody else. You know, it, is, it is my idea that when we start having these conversations with law enforcement, that we will document what's going on. How, do, how are we getting from, from A to B? So we think that we can help other other uh, communities uh, that are looking for a start. And she said, you know, okay. I think Mary Ann has something she wants to say or ask. Um, I recently became familiar uh, with a woman by the name of Jane Elliott. I don't know how many of you have ever looked up Jane Elliott, uh, but I uh, suggest that you do on, she's interviewed, she's an 86 year old woman, sharper than a tack. I wanna be Jane, I wanna be Jane Elliott when I grow up. And um, she, I, I'm just telling everybody, uh, just Google her, watch interviews of her. Oh, she's a white, an old white lady who hopefully can um, talk to other white ladies to yeah. start, to start the discussion and to start the thought process in your head of, of all the ways that um, biases, microaggressions are just built in uh, deep inside us that we don't even realize. And um, anyway, there's my two cents. <laughs> and, and I agree. We had that discussion early on um, about, about uh, Ms. Elliott, and I just recently seen her on television. And you're right, she's she is sharp. Um, but she was, she was ahead, ahead of her time uh, back then when she did her study. Uh, but doing it um, and today, if you take those lessons uh, and putting yourself in that situation, in, in situation where you see people being harmed, uh, I think that you get the same effect. Um, if you see that that because you're not saying nothing uh, harms another then that's, that's something questionable that you need to ask yourself. Now with, I think Linda froze up for a second. Oh, did I? Somebody trying to tell me to shut up, do that. But it ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> um, could I ask, I don't know if I need to, could I ask a question of, of uh, Linda? I know that you've been uh, participating for several years on the Minority and Police Partnership. Um, and so many of the conversations recently have been around relationships with law enforcement in the community. How are you optimistic or what have your feelings been around uh, your relationship and our relationship with law enforcement? Well, uh let me let me preface it by, by this that when we got together, it may be 13, 14, 15 years now. And it was it was the first of its kind where you had all the chiefs of police, the chair, and the uh and you had the uh uh what's what's the other folks? To do the highway. What's the other? The state police. State police. Yeah. So you had everybody at the table, you know, 
uh, it's, it's the first of its kind to come to the table and let's talk about and have those hard conversations. Now, I will say, in the beginning, uh, it was rough. It was rough. She froze up again. Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? And so, and so I mean that because of those uh, strong relationships in the beginning uh, set us apart for today. And I, I think that the benefits outweigh the negative, which it is civilians at the table, not just the NAACP. There are other civilians at the table and they're talking about what their community is talking about. And also law enforcement has given us a, 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 a glimpse into the things that they have to deal with. So two-way street, you know, it ain't just civilians coming in and saying these things. Law enforcement is, is, is informing us and educating us as the reason why they do some things. Mm -hmm. And so we appreciate that. So it is a benefit. We've made great strides. Uh, we want to do better. Uh, one of the things that's on the table is to get law enforcement out to the, uh, get them out into the junior high because by the time they hit high school, some decisions have already been made for them by their actions and behavior. But if you get them when they're younger, because if there are police officers in the home, in most cases, the succession would be more police officers coming from that home. And so we want to introduce them early into law enforcement, uh, 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 being doctors and nurses and everything else. Great. Thanks, Linda. Beth, did you have a question? I do have a question. So um, I'm going to be, I may misspeak, but I've, I've been thinking a lot about how we can um, work on this from different perspectives. And a lot of us, as you've noticed, we are engaged women and we serve on all kinds of boards throughout the community. And I've been looking around at some of the boards I serve on and most of our, the boards look a lot like me. <laughs> and so um, I'd like to you know, invite women of color to serve on the boards that I serve on. I don't want to come off as saying, you know, um, we need a black person on our board. To me, that just sounds offensive. So can you no, suggest? No, 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 go ahead and say it. Okay. I don't want to be offensive. I do want to include women of color and Latinx and others on the boards I serve on because I think we're missing the boat by not doing that. So if you say, go ahead and just say it that way, then I will. Say it like that. Okay, thank you. I, you I, agree. Okay? I agree, I agree. Okay. I, I don't think it's anything to apologize for, for wanting to promote diversity and inclusion in our work and in our service to our community, you know? And uh, actually that that is, uh, it can be very powerful because then we are inviting people into some of those uh, spaces where decisions are made um, and it, it really can make a huge difference. So thank you for that suggestion. Well, thank you for letting me know. I can say it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, and we want people Look around you, you know, what does that look like, you know, and if everybody looks like you, that's a problem, you know, you need to do something different. In addition to that, when you have social events, what does that look like? You know, if you're going to, I, I, I couldn't, I could not imagine having a party be diverse. That's just how I see things is that it's not just one or the other. You know, we have got to be open to uh, uh, looking like what we want the world to look like. 
sometimes that means even putting ourselves in vulnerable situations, going, uh, maybe visiting uh, a restaurant in a neighborhood that, uh, that we're not familiar with, or we, it's a new experience, or going to another church. So there is a level, and I would encourage us to all have that level of discomfort sometimes to put ourselves in uh, situations where we are then able to meet and engage with diverse people um, in, in, in their own settings and in our own setting. And I really have to say, I'm very hopeful with some of our young people that are just pushing all of us to do better, aren't they? They just out on the front lines. Um, we have, we've had, you guys are probably familiar with the anti-black ISU movement here it's at uh, ISU. And you know, the students, similar to the high school students at Unit 5, they, uh, they came in with a set of expectations and demands for justice, for changes in a number of areas. And, um, but also just the fact that when you look out at some of the protests, you're seeing multi, racial, multi-ethnic uh, young people coming out together with a full force. And that really gives me hope that uh, we're turning a corner. I just uh, want to thank Beth for bringing up her question. And I think, I, I think um, Dr. Houston, you just made this point that part of what we as, as leaders in our communities need to do is to make ourselves vulnerable to ask questions like that um, and to to draw on the youth around us. I currently work with um, a young professional who reminds me almost every day that she's half my age. Um, but I have learned an incredible amount from her. I would love to think that she's learned an incredible amount from me. Um, she is biracial and we have had some really honest just genuine, you know, hard conversations recently, um, just as coworkers and friends, and about things that happen in our organization and how we represent our families and our people, and um, and conversations about systemic issues, and and you kind of have to be willing to put yourself out there. I think, um, you know, I was raised in a a rural farming community, a very small town. My background is very different than hers. She was raised in a more urban setting, um, but we just have really learned from one another. And I think the more that we as leaders can do exactly what Beth just said um, and bring others to the tables where we sit, we will learn from one another. And you know, honestly, uh, as I've had a chance to talk with others, uh, read, and, and particularly part of uh, some of the work I do in the School of Social Work, uh, many of our rural communities are facing some of the same things that we see going on in urban, urban uh, communities, such as a lack of funding for school, lack of access to health care. There are so many areas that we really do uh, have, have similar needs and similar issues, but I think we have just been taught, we've been conditioned to see uh, groups that are not like us as the other instead of looking towards some of those things that we have in common. Okay, thank it looks like our time <clears throat> is about up. Wow. We could go on for another 90 minutes, I think, easily and have <clears throat> much more great conversation. Um, I think just a thank you isn't even enough uh, to everybody on the phone but or on the call, particularly Dr. Houston and Linda Foster. I am, I am, we are so grateful for your time and your insights and sharing about yourselves and your history and um, uh, this was really a lot of food for thought for me and hopefully for other people on the call. And I think women to women, as we look about some strategic ways to support um, ourselves, our community, our families, uh, this is really the next right step for us. So thank you, thank you so much. 
Um, if I could also say the third of our three um, sessions is on food insecurity in our community, just for you to know if you haven't registered. Food and, and housing. Uh, huh? Food and housing. Like I said, I'm, I'm of course, food and housing insecurity. And it is next Thursday, July 9th at 8.30. And uh, let you know, right? Let yeah. Michelle, Michelle know or anybody if you want to uh, participate in that. So thank you, Karen. No, um, I just my wanted pleasure. to mention, yeah, you were great moderating this. I just wanted to mention one thing um, yep. that we will make this video available probably tomorrow. Yep. Um, I'll send a link out to everybody who was registered for this, but I'll also post it on the um, IPCF website. I'm going to um, try to come up with a list of resources that, um, like the video link, sorry the sound didn't work on that, um, some other things like a link to um, Jane Elliott's work, uh, The Class Divided, um, and some other things, uh, the black tax um, video that uh, both Doris and, and Linda talked about. So there's going to be some things that if you're interested and you want to follow up further, we will provide some um, extra resources for you if, you know, this was um, uh, sparking something more for you. So just wanted to thank everybody, especially Linda and Doris. Thank you for coming and Karen for moderating. Oh, you're welcome.